Sing for Science is made possible in part by support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Today's episode was recorded remotely from Bakersfield, California and Oakland, California, and it contains content related to mortuary science that some listeners may find disturbing. Be sure to check out our other episodes and please enjoy the show. When I crack a brain, a head open, it was decomposed. The brain was liquefied with soup. It, and it comes out the ears, someone told me, sometimes. It kind of bubbles out the ears. If you cut into the skull and you crack the, the skull cap off, it's... It's soup, yeah. Soup. And then there's something called frothy purge, which I love lingo. I love the lingo of science. Oh. And um, there were some great ones. Frothy purge. Frothy purge. It just comes, it's these bubbles just come out of the <laughs> yeah, mouth. Yeah, right, right. The bubbles coming out. You got your plain purge, your frothy purge. Welcome to Sing for Science, the show where musicians and scientists talk about music and science. I'm your host, Matt White. Each week we'll talk about a song by our guest artist and how it connects with our guest scientist's area of expertise. Today we'll be speaking with Jonathan Davis, frontman of the pioneering metal band Korn. Korn's most commercially successful album was 1998's Follow the Leader, having hit number one across four charts and sold over 14 million albums worldwide. The album's fourth track is called Dead Bodies Everywhere and was inspired in part by Jonathan's job working in a morgue before his music career took off. Also joining us is best-selling popular science writer Mary Roach. Mary is the author of a string of one-word science books including Spook, Bonk, and Fuzz. The first in this series is 2003's Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, and won Mary several awards and critical distinctions. Her reporting not only details the unique scientific contributions of the deceased, but also provides elaborate explanations into the process of tissue decay and how mortuary science works to stall it. The title of this week's episode on the podcast is Dead Bodies Everywhere, Postmortem Biology and Funerary Science. Hello, Jonathan and Mary. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey. Thanks for having us. You know, I don't consider myself a morbid person, but this is a dream come true, I got to tell you. I mean, I, I've been trying to find a reason to have both of you on the show for a while, and when I found out that you, Jonathan, used to not only work in a morgue, but also wrote a song related to that experience. So, yeah. I mean, the whole thing practically writes itself. There are a couple songs about working there. What was the other one? Um, there's one, uh, Pretty. Oh. That was when I worked at, uh, it was an intense case. When I worked at the coroner's office, we can get to that later, but there's that. And then the dead bodies was overflowing in the morgue when I worked at the mortuary. Okay, so dead bodies everywhere kind of spells out pretty clearly what it must have been like to work in a morgue, but I know there's more to the song than just about that. I mean, can you? Can yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my, when I worked at the mortuary, my, my kitchen was overflow for the morgue. There's literally dead bodies were everywhere. <laughs> when the morgue was full, then we would put some more into my kitchen, which I had a little apartment in the mortuary. When we had too many, too many bodies or too many, you know, bodies were backed up and waiting for uh, funerals. Um, after we get done embalming them, they would have to put them on, a, you know, on the tables and they'd sit there waiting to get dressed and put in the caskets and all the stuff like that. So sometimes we get a lot of cases and then my overflow was my kitchen. And literally I come out of my bedroom and there's dead bodies everywhere. Holy shit. So still like it's that. good that they were yeah. embalmed already. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to, no. Because no. that could be fragrant. These humps are not fun. No. And so was this in Bakersfield? Yeah. Because it's hot there. Yeah. So you don't want to mess. It's hot, up. but they were embalmed. Once you're embalmed, they're fine. Were you still a teenager when you had this job? I first started doing posts when I was 17 years old, yes. Oh, my God. And that was at, at the, the coroner's office. And then from there, I graduated high school and went directly to San Francisco College of Mortuary Science. Oh, I went there. Was Mac there? Mac was there. Mac was my, my chemistry and a teacher, yeah. Oh, he my had God, like a, Mac. He was ready. He had this big kidney stone that he <laughs> In his class that he said he they took out her pad. It was ginormous. Oh, he was he the was, best. Mac McConaughey, awesome. right? I knew that there was going to be a gazillion points of connection. That I'm sure we'll... 
We're, it's a small little click, man. It's a small, small industry. So how did you get drawn into that world in the first place? I just always, since I think I can, from, I can remember, I was always drawn towards darker things. Mm-hmm. Those things intrigued me and still intrigue me. I mean, I mean, I love happiness and light and all that stuff too, but also there's the dark. And at that point in my mind, I was like thinking, oh, when I was in high school, I went to this thing called Regional Occupation Program and they had the coroner's office as one of the things you could go do. A lot of people were studying to go be x-ray techs or respiratory therapists, but I chose uh, autopsy assistant. Wow. But it wasn't like, a oh, school, go just jump in there. I had to go through three different interviews and go through a psychological back. And I, had to did, I did all this stuff, all these different interviews and all this stuff to be able to uh, do that. And I passed all of them. And I started my junior year of high school as an autopsy assistant for the county coroner's office. And so do you remember your first autopsy? Like yesterday, I'll never forget. That was like when you came face to face with mortality right there. It's like, and I learned it in college that America is a death denying society. We all think we're going to live forever. Sure. But when you're staring death right in the face, and this wasn't a very nice one. This was a car accident and this person was pretty beat up. It really shocked me. And I'll never forget the sound of a scalpel cutting flesh. I'll never forget the first time I saw the viscera laying there opening up the Y incision and seeing the viscera all there. I'll never forget those things. Doctor going there, taking samples and then me having to sew them up. I just like, it really affected me. I mean, how could it not? It's just reality. Man. Yeah. But dead bodies everywhere. There's another component to it. It seems like it addresses your relationship with your parents. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was like, they wanted me to do this or that. Like, you need to get a real job, that kind of... Just don't normal stuff parents do, because yeah. I'm a parent. I want my son to be yeah. successful, my sons to be successful. Yeah. And they just wanted me to get a normal job. Yeah. And I'm not normal, I guess, <laughs> with they on those terms. I chose to be a mortician or an autopsy assistant, yeah. because I really, in my heart, I wanted to be a musician. But they were pushing me, no, you can't, you're not going to make it as a musician. You need to have a real job, that kind of vibe. Yeah. They, they kind of, like, pushed me into that, and then in turn, and I've always said this, I shouldn't have been doing autopsies at 17 years old. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have seen the things I saw at 17 years old because it really messed me up. I had nightmares for a long time. I had all kinds of stuff that I had to work through because I was subjected to this horrifying things that I saw at such an early age. But no one knew at the time. And I was really enjoying it and lying on myself. But I I saw some really bad stuff I shouldn't have seen. In the timeline of of Korn's career, that was what five years before your first record so yeah i, was, I worked at the mortuary when he said when he said 89 went to mortuary college 91 92 93 i was doing my apprenticeship at the mortuary and uh i was a volunteer deputy coroner and doing autopsies sometimes when they needed my help and then my apprenticeship ended and i got the opportunity to go try out for this band it was it turned out to be corn, and I just left it all behind after that. Yeah. To go with my heart, what I really, really wanted to do is be a musician. Right. And I was just looking at your last tour. I mean, you guys are still doing arenas. I mean, not many people get to do that besides Stones. Yeah. I don't know. It's just amazing. I'm, I'm very lucky to be doing I'm just 28 years, and I'm still playing amphitheaters and arenas, and I'm very, very lucky I know this. It's incredible. And what's interesting is it seems like you acknowledge that you've always kind of been drawn to the the darker elements and I dug up this profile of you guys or maybe it was just a view from Melody Maker maybe late 90s and they you know, they call you a quote an icon for the disturbed and dispossessed you know which kind of tracks with someone who might have had a a job in a morgue but they they also they talk about your performance and it was talking about the way that you were on stage and you were kicking and it was kind of a withdrawn way of processing emotions and I I watched a recent show of you guys. There was something so incredibly life affirming about it and open and positive. And not to say that the former maybe didn't have those elements. And I realized that was a much different chapter in your life, but I think it's worth remarking on that you're able to kind of combine those elements and you're still singing songs called dead bodies everywhere. Yeah, man. It's the way I've dealt with everything I've been through in my life. I've ever had a very happy life. And now it's amazing. I mean, but I think it's like everybody. We have our ups and downs. And I choose to do my art on the darker stuff in my life. And it really moves me. So when I get up there and sing those songs, I'm just letting loose. I let loose. I just go somewhere else. I let all the emotions come out. And then when I'm done, I just kick back. And I'm happy because I don't have any of this stuff built up inside me. 
yeah, it's it's just how I've figured out how to get through my life. It's a beautiful yeah. thing to see, you know. Thanks, man. So, yeah. So it sounds like maybe to some degree you're able to compartmentalize a lot of these interests. I mean, do you still have some interest in mortuary science? I mean, I collect all kinds of stuff. I still love mortuary science. I have a bunch of of old mortuary equipment and stuff like that. Um, I love medical preparations. I collect those old ones, old quack medicine stuff. <laughs> There's all these different ones. There's these, <laughs> it's, it's stupid, but I got like these, just quack medicine stuff. This is a perfect one. These crazy box of rectal plugs are supposed to help you cure asthma and insomnia. Just funny, just, I love that old quack medicine stuff. Um, bougies, they call them bougies. Bougies? <laughs> Is that, they're, well, they're, the, those are the rectal oh, dilators, no. and they would sell them in kits. Like they'd get bigger and bigger. Like you could have the advanced rectal dilator. Yeah, once you like you graduate. Wow. <laughs> After so long, yeah, it's, it's just stuff like that. I, I like to collect. I have a bunch of like haunted artifacts and all kinds of just stuff. More of this macabre stuff. That's just it inspires me, and I love being around it. What's your source? Like, is it on eBay? Do you look for that kind of thing? I, this stuff finds me, man. I swear. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. I'm sure. It really does. I don't actively go looking, but most of the stuff I found, like my hundred dollars stuff like that, is because I go around like town and when I'm on tour, I go up and I ask, what is the one thing in here that makes you feel the most uneasy? Mm. And there's always something, oh, come here. That, and I, and I buy that. Were you familiar with Mary's book? Had that ever come across your desk? No, but... Um, I definitely want to check some of your books out. Well, this one is an amazing book. I got it for Christmas when it came out in 2003 or four, and it's still, not surprisingly, one of the most memorable books I've ever read. I can still retell certain passages. So, Mary, what stands out in your mind? Because exhaustive research went into this. You're visiting morgues. You're visiting crash tests with cadavers. You're visiting this body farm, which is insane. What stands out in your memory 20 years later? Uh, I think the, I guess the body farm, but I was going to say the very first chapter I reported was at the mortuary college that Jonathan went to. And it was the first time I'd seen a body uh, other than I had a job as a janitor at college where where I grew up in high school. I was a cleaner. And one time I got assigned to the morgue, but those bodies were all under these kind of clear plastic tarps. So they were, it was, which was kind of creepier in a way, because it was dark. It was after hours. And I was like, <laughs> with my broom. <laughs> so that's actually technically uh, the first dead bodies I've seen. But the one that I saw, okay, the one that they were being trained on was a body it was a reject. You know, this guy had donated himself to medical science, but he was rejected because he'd had an autopsy. So he's got this, see, he's like, his torso is just like a gaping red hole. And I'm not prepared for the, for that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, it, you know, with the viscera bag, but mm. but the, without the organs, you know, they're in the bag and it's this just this blood red shell. And I realized years later, because for a few days after that, that image kept popping into my head. And I was thinking, maybe this book wasn't such a smart idea. Maybe I'm not okay with this. But, you know, two days, three days later, the, the images started going away. But that is, I realized much later, that's something people with PTSD have that, where these really gruesome things like that they've seen pop into their head. I don't know if you ever had that, Jonathan. Yeah, I did a lot. Because I did... I autopsy babies oh, um, man. And, and toddlers and five and six year old children. I, I did an autopsy on this little boy and we opened up his stomach and found a bag of raw cocaine in it that he ingested. Oh, yeah. I saw just things, like I said, that ugh, it still gets to me. I have children that just like, oh, I became such a hard, I had no feeling and I hated that. I had to have no feelings. I wouldn't, insane. Yeah. I uh, know. Uh, this woman I met years later, she's the medical examiner for Oakland, California. We have a lot of pretty grisly crime here in Oakland. Yeah. And she she said, okay, you know, I think she made it a personal goal to make me gag, which I had never, you know, people would say, did did this book, did you ever throw up? I'm like, nah, you know, I'm I'm pretty, I'm not squeamish. But she brought me in and there were these, I don't, I don't know why I'm telling you this, that really wasn't the question, but there was... These two people who'd been found in an apartment after 
I don't know. They were very bloated. They were big people to begin with, and they were in that bloat stage. And she cut them open, and the smell. Oh, that's the worst. Oh, my God. I mean, I gagged. I've never gagged in my life. I think of myself as somebody pretty macho when it comes to things that are gross. I left the room, and she was like, what's the big deal? It's just like changing a diaper. I'm like, no, it's not. I think 50 diapers would smell that smell. It's horrible. And in your book, you describe what is at the root of that smell. I've never smelled anything beyond like a dead roadkill. Yeah. But could you talk a little bit about that? What's what's going on there? Well, what's going on basically is that you know, when you die, your cells have these enzymes and they, you know, they need to break things down so they can use them. And uh, when you die, they start these enzymes sort of break down the cells themselves. So all the liquid in all your cells kind of leaks out and you get sort of gushy and there's a lot of fluid going everywhere and bacteria love that. So the bacteria are going crazy and the fluid's making its way to the parts of the body where there's a lot of bacteria, the guts, the, you know, the, once the guts open up and the, there's just this crazy bacterial feast and bacteria when they're eating, uh, they're like you, they break things down and a fart, basically, they, they produce gas, as you do when you eat and digest. So they're digesting and they're releasing tons of gas, which builds up and um, at some point your interior organs may burst. And so there's just a lot of room for the gas to be going everywhere. So the things that tend to be bloating are places where there's a lot of bacteria like the scrotum and the mouth and the gut so there's you know i haven't discussed this in a long time i've like uh, i just reread it i'm glad to give you the venue to do so yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) anyway that's what's going on and putrefaction is just more breaking down and liquefying and at the body farm you would Mm. see in the advanced stages of putrefaction, just it's kind of like a puddle all around. You kind of you kind compared it to like in the Wizard of Oz, the bad witch is melting. You know, just becoming this pool. Yeah. So you're just becoming liquid, mm. except for of course you're you're depending on the how dry it is. You know, your skin and bones take longer. Your that's the last thing to go. You know, the wetter stuff is like the brain goes, the eyes go fast. The wet stuff goes first, and then yeah. the the harder stuff takes a longer time to break down and there's bugs that help with that and sometimes rodents so you know the whole thing ends up getting broken down though one way or another could you tell jonathan about the body farm what the body farm was oh sure sure the body farm is a place at university of tennessee was the original that's where i went and stiff there's now there's like they're everywhere they have them in different uh, environments because it, it, it's a place to study the forensics of human decay and that is something that is used uh, to try to solve crimes like say you have a body and you want to figure out how long has this person been dead how long have they been lying there in order to understand that you got to factor in the temperature uh, is the was the body wet is it dry is it a very humid place or a very arid place was the body clothed was it naked was it in water all of these things affect the timeline of decay, so um, they study that, and that information informs the criminal forensics process, the process of figuring out how long this person has been dead. So the body farm is a place where they study that, and they've been doing that for years. Because wow. uh, it used to be, you know, sometimes they were way off, and then they'd be a body would be discovered, and they'd say, yeah, this looks like six weeks, and it would be like 25 years, because it, it just depends on... Sometimes bodies are naturally preserved by the environment. You know, if it's very arid, they kind of mummify and they don't look soupy and they don't, you know, break down completely. Uh, So anyway, that's the body farm. But what I loved about it (laughs) is that it's this beautiful little patch of land, like off beyond, beyond the medical center. It's got hickory trees and squirrels. And it's really like you walk in, you're like, oh, this doesn't seem that bad, you know, and then. (laughs) Then they're like, oh, there's a guy taking a nap over there under a tree. <laughs> they're, and they're, yeah. they're just placed here and there, wow. kind of like, um, it doesn't look like a scientific facility. Like there's a guy lying under a tree and, and they were studying the effect of clothing that day. So he's wearing like sweatpants and a sweatshirt. And it really just sort of looked like a guy napping, except that weird stillness that dead people have. 
And so were they kind of grouped by uh, where they're at in the process of decay? Was that right? Well, it depends on what they're studying. Like there's a section where they have dermestid beetles. They clean okay. bones. Mm-hmm. So they're, I'm not sure if they were processing. Uh, just cl- they were cleaning skeletons for some reason. There's like the neighborhood of skeletons. And then the other ones, they were, you know, like the clothed guy was under a tree. And then there was a woman that you would kind of walk through the, they weren't arranged in any, it was like, what, what, what's your project, you know, kind of stake out your land. And some of them had a covering to keep scavengers out, but most of them were just kind of lying there dead. Wow. <laughs> Jonathan, you would love it. <laughs> I would actually. <laughs> and there's one, That's now there's cool. one in California, no. there's one in the Central Valley, because oh, wow. they want them in different like they would want uh, like a dry, arid place and then some a humid place, you know. So there's one in the Midwest. There's one in New England now. Right. Uh, but the original was in Knoxville, Tennessee. Wow. Earlier you mentioned that the brain and the eyes, that those go pretty fast because they're so liquidy. And so what happens? The There's just a, a vacant spot where the eye once was? Um you describe them as X's in the book. Yeah, they the eye does have that kind of the pupil because it, it kind of collapses, so they don't have that dark black area. They kind of just look. It's they're very. It's very weird. I asked this guy at the mortuary college. I'm like, how did you decide to get into this? And he said, well, this is back before pagers and and cell phones. He said, you know, you could have a free apartment upstairs from the mortuary. Because you had to be there on call when the body came in. Yeah. There was like free room and board. When I went to colleges, like I got free room and board. Well, I had to I had to buy food, but I got a free room yeah. and woke up and went to school. All day came back and I just had to do removals at night. We were on call. So we stayed and lived in the mortuary. What was the process of removals like? Well, you just you get a call, you'd get the address and you'd go pick someone up who passed away. Mm-hmm. It was it's tricky, especially in some of the places in San Francisco and the mission and all that. I got a call and I went and this was a really big person, two, 300 pounds, and I couldn't get him. And then we had to like go down a spiral staircase because there was no way out because those old buildings, the way they're built. So we had to strap them on there and we had to get family members and other people in the building just to help. I think one time we called the fire department just to help get them out and get them into the car. And then once I got them to the removal van, take them to the mortuary, how am I going to get this? Per- there was always oh, this, how am I going to get this person out? But then there was other ones where it's just, it's really simple. You'd go in and it was just an easy removal mm. and bring them into, take them into the embalming room and leave them for the embalmer to come. Cause I couldn't embalm then. I was just an apprentice or I was just going to school. I wasn't even an apprentice yet. But when I worked at the other mortuary, when I was an apprentice, I have to always, when I was embalming, I had to have the embalmer there with me to watch me. Okay. I used to live by this park in, in Brooklyn. Um, and there were a lot of alcoholics who would, expire in the park it would happen from time to time and one time i went out for a walk and there was a guy who was like clearly late stages of alcoholism and he had he was kind of looked like he was lying down across the street from my apartment i went up to ask if he was okay and he kind of grunted at me and i went off to the park and as i was walking away i just like my mind was putting together what i just seen and i was just like that did not make sense so i i went back and literally in 3 minutes he was dead right but because it wasn't a crime and because he had no family it fell into this weird pocket in new york city where it was just the, only the coroner could remove the body not an ambulance not a cop no and so the coroner in New York city, as you can imagine, was very backed up. So what they had to do was just have a cop sit in a car just next to the body until the coroner could come pick it up. And so it was just laying there all day long under a sheet. I believe it. So you started to talk about embalming, which is one of the other things that, that I'd like to talk about here. So you, what do you remember about that process? It's just like you're, replacing the blood in the body with embalming fluid which is formaldehyde and other chemicals they look so much better they look way better once, it, once i want to be embalmed once you <laughs> it, pl- it plumps you oh. up once you put the fluid in you just like it, it yeah and it makes it gives you color got yeah. color in it right yeah it's got coloring it's like this it's pink an amazing color. transformation it, it makes everything it freezes everything so when you touch the skin there's none of this right it's just like hard as a rock yeah. 
if you do it right, right. And, and how it depends on the pressure how much you're you're getting into capillaries and the tissue how much you massage so basically real short if it's a normal if it's not an autopsy you make an incision right here on your on your the bone yeah. right here and you dissect and you get the jugular and the carotid artery right you'll inject into there using a, an embalming machine which acts like a heart and you're going to pump that fluid into the body and use the jugular vein you have a pair of forceps i have a pair of them right mm -hmm. here somewhere and you go down the jugular into the heart kind of area and you're pulling the clots out you just sit there and you and it leave that vein open and you let the embalming machine do its work it's going to pump the embalming fluid in and push the blood out and while that's going on you cover the body in soap and you start massaging so if you're shooting down in the blood you're going to start massaging up from the hands because you want to get the blood out mm. so you're going to massage the entire body you're going to try and get the blood out of the body and get the fluid in so it gets into the capillaries and it totally gets in saturates the tissue with this formaldehyde which then like it sanitizes the body and and totally preserves it kind of an amazing idea to use the human circulatory system to get that fluid everywhere like yes. it, it, to all your cells i mean it's brilliant you know because i don't know the early the you know mummification is kind of like yeah. You know, you pack the body in something and you maybe stuff some down the mouth. But this, like, so, this to have that idea to pump like a heart, like Jonathan said, you're, you know, replacing the blood with this preservative that kind of links the proteins together. It just basically keeps bacteria from being able to break the cells down the way they normally would. It also kills them. But that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah right. The jugular is that the same thing as the aorta? No, that's your heart. The the big the aorta is in your chest. Heart artery. It goes all the way down into your. What's the jugular? This is a vein, that's right? That's in your neck. So yeah, the jugular is your vein. So your artery is oxygenated blood. Yeah. And then the jugular is when the heart's pumping the the carbon dioxide blood. I call it out. <laughs> so you're going in through the carotid and out through the jugular. And Mary, in your book, you talk about it looked like the end of a whoopee cushion, right? It was that wide? It did to me, that like the guy Theo, he raised the artery, I think it was the artery, yeah, the carotid. Yeah, they're connected together like this. Yeah, he, he, but the end of it, to me, looked like what you blow on a whoopee cushion. I mean, it's big. It's like a gronk and big yeah. tube. <laughs> Yeah, there's there are two tubes. It's hard. You got to dissect them apart. But, and that's if they haven't been autopsy. Now, if their autopsy is a total different thing, because the pathologist has gone in there and just ripped everything out. So there's no circulatory. System. Exactly, it's a mess. So now you got to do. If you can find the carotid, you'll shoot up just for this side of the head. You'll shoot down here and these arteries here just to do the arm, and you'll shoot down the arteries of the legs to get that. So you're doing one, two, three, four, five, six points of injection. Because you don't have a closed system anymore. You don't have a closed system. Oh, and also once you get done embalming, mm. then you have to go in with this stuff called cavity fluid. You use this giant trocar, it's called a trocar, it's a giant spike. Mm. And you have an aspiration tube, so it's sucking, it's like a suction. And you go in there and you just try to make mincemeat of all the organs in there. So they can't blow up, like she said, when they start to come down, they'll start to fill up full of air. So you poke everything and you just make it all mincemeat in there. And then you stick it in there and you take the suction tube off and you put cavity fluid, which is like an even more intense uh, formaldehyde. And that preserves that in there. And then the autopsy, you just take cavity fluid and you open up the plastic bag and you just dump it in there. Well, so then do you ever like rupture a vein when it's being pumped in and end up just in the entire... I mean, you can do what happens if you're not paying attention. Sometimes there's clots that get in there or something. You got to watch the pressure. You can distend. You can blow someone's face up really big or they'll start to swell. And then what do you do? So you got to really watch that. You got to watch and you can see it start to happen and then you stop. Okay. And you try to get out there and, and pull the clot out, or you just stop there because you don't want to stint a person's face this big. Like if you do a cadaver, cadavers are like, I don't know how many, I think it's like double the amount of fluid you would use or triple the amount of fluid you would use on a normal embalming, but there's no drainage. You just blow them full up. Wait, what's the difference between a cadaver and, I mean, what distinguishes a cadaver from another? Research, like for anatomy lab, oh. you're basically like mummifying those suckers. To keep them for a lot longer, like normally, correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, embalming is to keep the body looking decent for like an open casket. Like it doesn't have to look good for a very yeah, long, for a yeah, a couple days. days. But if you're going to have an anatomy class that's a whole semester that you just 
mummify that sucker. A lot of formaldehyde. Really intense in formaldehyde. You're changing the formula. I was at the anatomy lab at UCSF. And what was that experience like? What do you recall from that? Um, the stench of formaldehyde. I mean, really strong. And it's pretty toxic stuff. So at a certain point in the semester, they would cut the legs off because they were done, partly, but also to lower the amount of exposure to, to formaldehyde, you know, because it's not a pleasant smell. But the other thing was um, what was I found kind of fascinating was not something in the lab, but the fact that, and this is much more common now than it was back then, they were, this is one of the earlier schools that actually did a memorial service for those cadavers. Like all the students, they got together and, and the, I think family members of the cadavers and, and the students read these tributes and, and it was kind of moving, you know, because initially I heard, oh, they're doing a memorial service for the cadavers and I was picturing like, what caskets with the bodies and I was kind of like I got to see this but it was in fact just just the students and they had they, it was very touching they were mm -hmm. very kind of grateful and you know the things that they wrote were pretty moving as opposed to back in the very early days of teaching anatomy where you were encouraged to make jokes and to like pose the body with a cigarette mm -hmm. and with your arm around them you know they, they that was kind of like a way of coping back then with Totally a way of coping. Yeah, I mean, humor is a way of coping, and and um, yeah. that was kind of the standard practice. These days, it's there's a much more of a emphasis on respecting the gift of the donor, et cetera. And they did a good job of doing that. You know, I, I, I the day I was there, people seemed very respectful. Who knows? You know, when I'm I'm there with a notebook, so nobody's going to be, you know, jousting with legs or whatever. But, but you very effectively at the beginning of the book, I don't know if you're able to recall any of it right now, but it, it, you, you set a tone because, you know, I realized that like you, you fuse humor in popular science and, and that's the tone you use. But I think you, you really kind of, yeah. you establish a tone of respect at the very beginning of the book. Oh, that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> really? <No. laughs> It doesn't ring any bells. Um, no. I, mean, I can find it. Oh, here it is. Here it is. This book is not about death as in dying. Death as in dying is sad and profound. There is nothing funny about losing someone you love or about being the person about to be lost. This book is about the already dead, the anonymous behind the scenes dead. The cadavers I have seen were not depressing or heart wrenching or repulsive. They seemed sweet and well intentioned, sometimes sad, occasionally amusing. Some were beautiful, some monsters, some wore sweatpants and some were naked, some in pieces, others whole. I think that that was very artfully done, being able to tie all those things together. Yeah, you know, people would say, "Oh, you write about death." You know, could sometimes people would want like, "Oh, we're do we, we're doing some show about death." I'm like, I don't, I don't know anything about death. I didn't write about death. That's totally different to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the world of cadavers that they look like people, but they're not. They're dead. It's equally interesting, but just a whole different thing. I couldn't really write about death or I maybe I could but I don't really want to but it's a very different thing I mean the dead and there is humor I mean I was spent time at the the it's a, it's a school where it's in Michigan in Detroit what's the name of the university um, anyway they do a lot of automotive safety testing they use cadavers to calibrate crash test dummies <clears throat> they were coming up with a new like a side impact dummy and I was there when they were they were doing one of the impact tests with the cadaver, and they had to get this guy, uh, this dead guy, um, who had a number, UM006, I think, University of Michigan. This might have been. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they um, had to, he had to sit in a in a car seat, and then the impactor would hit him on the shoulder because it was you know they were doing trying to calibrate a side impact dummy. So he's sitting, and they had him. You know, he's a, he's a dead guy. So he, he can't sit up and they, they put him in the car seat and he kind of slump, <laughs> you know, and then they'd like tape him up and then they'd be all set and they'd have a lot of, you know, the strain gauges were all set and they've got the camera set, the video that, you know, the, to, to get the slow motion footage and everything's ready to go. And then he'd slump again. And it was hilarious. I mean, it was late at night, you know, everybody had been there a long time. Mm -hmm. He really had comic timing, this dead guy. You know, and he's wearing like a leotard, which <laughs> looks bizarre. Uh, and, and it was just, it was funny, not at his expense. You know, it's lovely that he donated his body. It was kind of heroic of him. 
And um, but there is humor in being dead. You're like you're you're useless. You know your limbs are flopping all over. You've got bubbles coming out of your ears. I don't know. Just why not laugh about it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all you can do. And Jonathan, do you make any in your attraction to darkness? or the macabre do you make that distinction between like what we've been talking about with your interest in mortuary techniques and science and actual death and the loss of life and end of life things like this i guess it's like two different things it's an art to what we did with mortuary science yeah basically artists yeah but also if you're you're just an embalmer which there are some just straight embalmers just all they do all day But I worked at the funeral home where you were an embalmer and funeral director. You had to deal with the family, and then you had to go embalm them, and then go do the funeral and everything. And doing that all the time, dealing with death, yeah. is very yeah. depressing. Yeah, it's not fun waking up every morning to family after family grieving over someone they lost. Uh, right. Because when you're in, the, and when you're in the, when you're in the morgue embalming somebody, you totally respect the body. It was someone's mom or dad, mm-hmm. but you don't know their story. You don't see their family. You don't see any of that stuff. So you're like, okay, this, this look at this older person had a great life, or it's a young kid. Oh, this is, a, this is horrible that this happened. And I go about my business and I'm do my job. But when I see the family, like say the kid, it's in there. I see their parents distraught, crying. They just lost their son. Their grandparents, all their friends, just. Mm-hmm. crying and and grieving over this person it wears on you man yeah, yeah. that's got to be the hardest part for sure that's a totally different thing yeah but i mean i wanted to be an embalmer but the the funeral home i worked at i had to be everything i was the apprentice so i'm out there mowing the lawn digging ditches for for sprinklers mm-hmm. oh go and bomb this person go do this i was doing everything so i saw everything what i really wanted to do is just be left alone and let me do my gig in the back in the morgue and i didn't have to see no one or do anything that would have been perfect but did you have to deal with the families like did you have to do yeah. the whole conversation about the yeah i would sit in they were teaching me that to be a funeral director and how that they you know the whole thing is how their wishes how which which cassock they're they're going to pick and how they wanted it, what the religion was yeah. what either a priest or a pastor i mean there's so many different things did you do preparation did i do what you know like preparation like you know sewing the mouth shut and putting the you know eye things in the eye and all that to make them yeah oh everything eye caps yeah yeah eye caps i did the eye caps and if you were you either use a the staple gun where they wire the jaw shut i was an old school guy i would just suture it and that's just going up through the lip through the nose that's what i saw the suturing yeah, yeah. you just suture and you tie it up like that and then you just use eye caps i have an eye cap <laughs> oh yeah i got a couple of those i would actually have some screw in like for trocars right you get a trocar button that's where they would seal that but i have a rectal one. Oh my god that's crazy. i didn't that's even know they rare. made those I wish they had those because I had to manually sew up a couple buttholes in my day. Well, you talk about that in your book, Mary, because there's leakage. That's right. Yeah, they. Yeah, because there's leakage. The day I was there, they were doing the demonstration, and they're like, "Well, for this guy, we we probably don't need to suture the anus." And, and they go, they look at me like, unless the visitor, <laughs> the visitor would like to see it. I'm like, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> No, yeah. you don't want them leaking in the casket. No, you don't. But I used to use this restorative clay, or they call it tamponing, and you use forceps and cotton, and then you seal it up with this clay. Oh, a butt plug. Yeah, it was kind of like an old school. But now it's this plastic trocar. Plastic what? What's it called? Plastic what? These little trocar buttons were these little buttons, and you'd screw them in to where the hole was where you stuck the trocar in, Okay. and it would seal it up so nothing would leak. But they made them for yeah. anuses. For in what 19th century? No, I mean it's now. Oh. They're new. I, when oh, I was new. in a mortuary okay. working, they didn't have them. Yeah, okay. They didn't have them at all. Now you just screw that thing in, and it's like it's got it's threaded, and it just threads like a screw, and you just, mm, and it's totally sealed. I wish I had that back then. Wow. And if we used vaginally anal, yeah, they didn't have that the day I was right. there. They were talking about just needle and thread, like they did with the mouth. Yeah. yeah, you'd sew the things up, but now, I mean, things I wish I had back then. Yeah. But things worked out different. I'm glad I'm a rock star. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> did, they, did they have a crematorium at the funeral home you worked at, Jonathan? No, but I'd have to take bodies all the time to the crematorium. It was another mortuary. Okay. Who had a crematorium. So they'd be put in a plastic. We'd make these plastic, like, coffins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not plastic. I'm sorry. Cardboard. Yep. And place them in there and then put them in the hearse and take them to the uh, crematory. Mm-hmm. And we pay them for their service, and then I pick them up in a plastic box, take them back to the mortuary, and then they be transferred into their urn that they bought. 
Okay. Well, that also Mary goes into the the process in the book about cremation, which was pretty wild, and it includes that bodies sometimes sit up. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Oh, they sit up. It's like a straw. If you put a flame to a straw, you're going to see it do all this weird crinkly. This the it's the heat. They'll pop right out of the box, sit up, and you just see them start breaking off. It's weird. Oh, because you could look into the oven while it was happening? Yeah, you can see there's a little hole. If you open it up, you can see it and watch. They have to have the viewing window for, is it Hindu families? Or there's some religion where the, you have to observe the body as it's being cremated. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. I'm not sure. I forget which. Speaking of Eastern religions, Mary, you bring up something in the decomposition. It was the... Uh, Nine cemetery contemplations, the Buddhist sutra on mindfulness. Do you recall? Well, this I, one? I do remember bringing that up, and I don't remember the words to it, but it was a, a uh, it, it's a meditation. You're supposed to meditate on the charnel house or something. We're supposed to go to a, I forget where you're supposed to go, but you're supposed to meditate on a charnel the ground. decomposing body, the process of death. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a Buddhist kind of way of teaching oneself that the body is not what matters and, you know, the impermanence of the body. And anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have it in I, front of I've me. Got a, I do. <laughs> you say, uh, apprentice monks are instructed to meditate on a series of decomposing bodies in the charnel ground, starting with a body, quote, swollen and blue and festering, progressing to one, quote, being eaten by different kinds of worms, then moving on to a skeleton without flesh and blood held together by tendons. The monks were told to keep meditating until they were calm and a smile appeared on their faces. Oh, it sounds like the body farm. Body farm. Yeah, I know. So we've just got a few more minutes here. Is there anything else that we should cover? I mean, this has been the most unique recording <laughs> that I've ever done in the dozens that I've done on the so show. I can't it's believe amazing. it's almost over. Oh, it's so yeah. sad. <laughs> the, the one thing that when I mentioned at the very beginning, the thing that always sticks with me that I remembered from when I first opened this book on Christmas morning was you talk about some of the earlier recorded research on dead bodies and it was in the french revolution those that were beheaded in the guillotine mm -hmm. and that there was some guy that was like running the heads down to his lab to see if he could frankenstein Jean, him or something Is yeah right? dude there was no it's just guy there it's in yeah. paris his name's fragonard oh because the guy oh so the fragonard because okay, it's also jean baptiste vincent labor and so there I've, I've held one there's a whole museum in france and nobody knows how he preserved them but he would dissect them right down the middle and they're perfectly preserved. They're like mummified. And you can just see and hold one and see just a perfect, you know, side view of the heads. Like the bodies exhibit. Like the body exhibit by Gunther von Hagen, I think his name. I think Fragonard was doing, it was plastination. Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. Wow. He was doing this way back before all that, during the guillotine time. So, wow. like I said, I love medical preparations. I collect them. I love just like the the uh there's a place in philly oh my god Mutter the Museum. Mutter museum the Mutter museum yeah. is one of my favorite places to go oh yeah. my, i know the the curator and uh, the director so anytime you want to behind the scenes they got some good stuff behind the scenes i i knew the lady gretchen I knew gretchen warden yeah she gretchen warden away, she died around 2004. yeah she would bring preparations on the johnny carson show gretchen's the one that would let me go in there i don't know the new people yet so I got to meet the new people because I love that place. Oh, yeah. Well, we should go together sometime. Yeah. That would be amazing. Uh, Anna Doty is the woman who's running it now who's got a real taste for the macabre. Wow. There's some really cool pieces in there. That's the thing that's got like the distended colon wrapping around several rooms. It's got the mega colon. Yeah. It's in this beautiful case, you know, and it's very quiet in there. Because if you go on a weekday, there's nobody in there. And you just sort of, it's kind of meditative. There's the colon. And it's as big around as I am. That is a big ass colon. Mm. It's huge, and they got the Siamese twins. There. So yeah, yeah, um, Chang and Ang. Chang and Ang, their their bodies are in and there. And then they'll be like, just the weirdest. Like this is a jar of skin that this woman would pick off her body, and she <laughs> sent it to them. I thought you might want this. So people <laughs> like send them. There's a necklace made of hemorrhoids. Um, that might be not on display. That might be in the back. Mm -hmm. But uh, there, I mean, it's just. Uh, you got to go in the back. There's some crazy stuff yes. in the back. <laughs> you got to go in the back. You know, there's. Yeah. A, this makes me think of um, an out-of-print book about the investigation into Elvis's death. 
and there's seriously detailed descriptions about the autopsy and specifically his colon and which, you know, had a lot of pharmaceutical. You know, I had a chapter on that. On Elvis's body? I, I interviewed his doctor. I have a chapter on megacolon and extreme constipation. And I went to see Needles Nick before he died. Dr. Dr. Nickopolis? Yeah. Yeah. I hung out with Dr. Nick. I tried on the hamburger ring that Elvis had made for Mrs. Nicopolis, which has diamonds in oh all the colors God. of like a hamburger and the bun and the pickles. Anyway, wow. yeah, no, I had a chapter on the mega coal. Elvis had mega Hirschsprungs. He had Hirschsprungs. Oh, yeah. It was like something like six feet of undigested pills or something like that. It, it was, was it was rock hard. And when Nick told me this, wow. he like knocked on the stone of the fireplace because it was rock hard like this. Nick was allowed at the autopsy? Well, um, I don't know if Nick was at the autopsy or he heard about it. I don't he probably I don't he, know, probably he was his doctor, he was his personal doctor, so probably he was there. Wow. Well, that's that's crazy. Crazy. Sorry, I was I interrupted you. No, no that's I could, cool. I talk talk about Dr. Nick all day. Um well that that was an interesting book and it goes all into the in- investigation and the autopsy. I've stuff read stuff that. Like that. Yeah, I've read that book, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Geraldo Rivera is involved for some reason. Anyway, this has been so incredible. I really appreciate this. This was awesome. I love, you know what I have to go through. <laughs> this was really cool. This was the best. It was great to meet you, Jonathan. Very nice to meet you, Mary. Hopefully we cross paths sometime. Check out Korn's line of Freak on a Leash pet accessories at freakonaleash.com. And they're here to slay hot sauce at heatness.com. A new edition of Mary's book, Stiff, was just released, as was the paperback version of her book, Fuzz. For excerpts and more information, please visit maryroach.net. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and made possible in part by a grant from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Our music is by Panoram. Social media manager is Bailey Constas. And digital producer is Keenan Cush. If you liked today's episode, please tell a friend about the show and give us a review and some stars. For more information, go to singforscience.org and follow us on social media at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening. Thank you.